Well, my next guests, their lives have been like a roller coaster ride. David Siegel was the billionaire king of the timeshare condo industry. And he and his wife, Jackie, were building the biggest house in America. The hit documentary called The Queen of Versailles captured the moment when the economic meltdown of 2009 rocked their world. They believe that film mis misrepresented their lives in a lot of ways, and it didn't show how they weathered the storm and prospered during the recovery. But all of their material success suddenly meant nothing when they got the shocking news that their teenage daughter, Victoria, had died of a drug overdose. What she left behind was a diary documenting her secret battle with opioids. The Seagulls have turned their backs on the business world and now devote their lives to battling the opioid drug epidemic that took their daughter and is taking the daughters of thousands of Americans in every level of neighborhood in this country. Would you please welcome David and Jackie Siegel. Thank you guys so much for being here to share Victoria's story. I know you called her Ricky, that was her nickname, 18 years old when she left. Too young. Way, too young. Way too young, she had her whole life ahead of her. I guess the big thing, I was reading through the book and, and one of the things that, that struck me was that you guys were blindsided by it. You had no idea the depth of trouble that she was in. Well, it's crazy because it happened right underneath our noses. And it just goes to show that the drug addiction is not racist, it's um, against wealth um, or anything. And um, one thing in the book is I really want it to be an eye-opener for other parents because it did happen right underneath our noses. We didn't see the, uh, the warning signs. And in here, we, from what we've learned over the past four years, um, we can see the warning signs and they're all in there. And when the parents read the, our daughter's diary, they can say, like, maybe my child has the same thoughts as theirs. You know, David, when I was reading, because really the book, you, you didn't just excerpt it, you actually published, and, and this is just an example. So this is the actual pages from the diary. Exactly, and like the, the middle of the diary, or the middle of the book, in the yellowish pages are exactly from her diary. And then the white pages are what my husband and I wrote and um, all the education that we've learned. And so it's kind of like a book within a book. I was uh, really impressed, David, by how just raw and earthy, because this is not something she was writing for the world to see at the time. This was her personal journey. Right. So some of it's pretty graphic and pretty tough. Four years ago when she died, uh, I was totally naive about the drug epidemic. I had no idea uh, anything. I was the most ignorant person in the world. And uh, I thought uh, drug addicts lived under bridges and slept on park benches. I had no idea that the more affluent you are, the better chance that you do have a child that's using drugs. But four years ago, I knew nothing. Today, I'm probably one of the few experts on the subject in the country. And I'll tell you that everything I learned is in that book. And if people read it and have teenage children, this will save lives. Uh, that's the reason we put it out, not, not for fame or glory, but just to educate people on the drug epidemic. And for me, as a mother, it was very hard for me to share my daughter's diary, you know, because it's just it's so intimate and personal. And um, but it was her dying or wish. It was she had sent me a text message, and uh, before she um, died of the overdose, and. Uh, she could see it coming, couldn't she? She knew every day that she took a pill or uh, used a needle or whatever it was that she was playing Russian roulette with the drugs. She knew she might not wake up that next morning. You know, yeah, people, go ahead, David. People don't realize just how bad the drug epidemic is. You know, we hear about the 31 people that were just killed in the mass shootings, but mm -hmm. the same day, 200 people died from a drug overdose. Today, 200 people will die from a drug overdose. Tomorrow, it's like an airliner crashing with 200 passengers every single day. And we have to put an end to this. We have to, through education, through speaking to these children, through drug testing, it all starts in middle school and it ends uh, with an overdose. And people don't even know that there's an antidote called naloxone 
that uh, we've now got distributed all over the country. It's saving thousands of lives every day. But up until a couple years ago, none of the first responders even carried it. You know, you were instrumental. You testified before Congress to get funds released so that first responders across the country would have access to this drug. And if there's a, a, a kid who is overdosing, turning blue, they simply yeah, get, you got it in got your pocket. In my He's pocket got, he, he comes prepared. <laughs> we go everywhere no, I, with I it. I think it's carry, important for this people This is to called know. Narcan. Okay. And someone could be laying on the ground, turning blue, one breath from death. The first responders or, or police put it in their nose, push a little button on the bottom, and within two to five minutes, they'll be sitting up telling you what they took. I mean, it, it's like an inhaler. You just put it in yeah, their nostrils they, and... It's called the Lazarus drug. It brings people, virtually brings them back from, from dead. And no one knows about it. it it's, it's sad that more people are not aware and that more entities across the country are not equipped for it. We got a law passed in Washington that provides over $1 billion that every first responder in the country carries this now, and they're saving thousands of lives. But why did it take us to have to do it? It should have been going on. This has been out 48 years. 48 and nobody, years. And nobody knew about it. Yeah, I'd never heard of it until I read the book, I and I, I, I never no heard of it. it. I think I'm fairly in tune with a lot of things going on. But David, that's one of the things that I found so stunning about the story that you tell. Um, you guys were close as a family. You had a good relationship with your daughter, the normal teenage stuff, you right. know, the conflicts and resolution and all that. But th this was not like a hostile environment. She had everything she could have ever wanted and needed. And we had, we had plenty of staff to look over her as well. Um, the, we had nannies and yeah. housekeepers. And and it was like she just was able to live this secret life that nobody was, could see. She was a mixed up teenager, like so many are. And we sent her to a psychiatrist to get counsel. And she came home and I said, what happened? She said, he put me on Xanax. I didn't know Xanax from Advil. I mean, mm. it, that's how dumb yeah. I was about drugs. And uh, after a few months, she wasn't getting any better. So uh, we sent her back. And she came home, I said, what happened? He doubled my dosage. That's how they treated her. Well, she became addicted to Xanax, but, um, um, and then after that, we never, she never has to go back to the doctors. Well, after her death, I found out she was getting pills from school. There from were other dealers kids. at the high school, and they actually had pill presses and were making their own drugs oh my at home and bringing them to, to school. Probably in some cases, kids who couldn't pass 11th grade chemistry class, but they were manufacturing yeah. drugs and selling yes. them to their fellow students. It's horrible out there. David, let's also talk, you and Jackie, about the fact we have a lot of states now that are mm -hmm. passing laws for recreational marijuana. People are saying, that's not a gateway, that doesn't have anything to do with it. Absolutely a gateway. Okay, so, so you're... Th they start with marijuana, they end <laughs> up with heroin, cocaine, prescription drugs. So I, I take it you're not a fan of the idea that people ought to have recreational access. We have access. a couple of different views. Okay. For, for me, um, um, the laws have gotten so strict with the opioids um, mm -hmm. that maybe they can only get five pills now. Um, and there are people that are in true pain. Sure. And I would feel better that they have a medical marijuana to... Well, I'm to, not talking about medical. Or, I'm talking about recreational, mm -hmm. where people okay. can get it just because they want to... So, you know, I think there's a very distinct difference. And clearly there are people who, as you mentioned, are in great pain. They need medication for the right. pain. And so we're not saying that all uh, prescription medication for pain is inherently uh, bad, but if it's not monitored and, and somehow controlled, that's where it gets out of hand. You know, the only good thing about marijuana is that it won't kill you, hmm. but unless you're driving, and you're stoned while you're driving and get an accident. But it lowers your IQ by over 10 points. Uh, you're, you're less uh, confident, you're less, it lowers your self-control, your grades suffer in school. Uh, there's nothing good to say about it. And people start on marijuana and they get a high. After a while they get used to it, they don't get a high, so they look for something that'll give them a bigger high, like as I said, cocaine. Heroin's very cheap. A lot of them are good. Now there's fentanyl that's coming in from China. 
a few grains, just a few grains of fentanyl will kill you. And so many people are now, like Prince died, and so many people I hear of are dying from fentanyl. The drug dealers are in competition with each other, so they're mixing fentanyl in with the, their heroin to see who can get a higher fix. And the drug addicts, they, they, want, they want the best fix they can, they can find. It, it's a hor horrible out there. And, and there's 25 million drug addicts in this country. 25, 25 million. That's someone yes. who used a drug to get high in the last month. There's 25 million in recovery. That's 50 million people. Just their parents and them alone, that's half our population is affected. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the audience here that have either lost somebody or know somebody they lost. We, we get calls almost on a daily basis from people that lost a loved one. Yeah, I don't know of anyone, quite frankly, mm -hmm. who has not been touched close from either a family member or a close friend or the child or of a close friend or family member because it is so epidemic. And I think the uh, startling thing that your book really reveals is that you can have all the wealth in the world and it doesn't protect it you. It, it goes through the poorest neighborhoods in America. It goes mm -hmm. through the most affluent neighborhoods in America. There's no neighborhood, there's no socioeconomic uh, strata in our society isn't. that isn't being touched. You guys there, have done a great service. There is no in this book. greater problem this country has today than the drug epidemic. We're losing our future Bill Gates, our future Steve Jobs. We're, we could be losing the cure for cancer. We're losing movies you'll never see and books mm. you'll never read. And it's, it's horrible. Our whole future generation we're losing because yeah. of these stupid drugs. And one thing um, I did come up with uh, after our daughter passed away, I um, had a girl follow us around with a camera and I created a documentary that I put on YouTube um, that, um, that shows like kind of the aftermath of us as parents, what we went through with the mm. loss of our daughter and how our family suffered and what we're doing about it. And I hope that that can be inspirational to other people. I think it and, will be, Jackie, and, and there's no doubt that people need to uh, to understand that this is not something that is gonna pass over your house. It could hit your home if you're not uh, fully engaged and alert, and that's why I think that their story and their candor has been so valuable. I wanna say my thanks and my prayers to David and Jackie Siegel. The book is called Victoria's Voice, Our Daughter's Losing Battle with Drug Abuse. Their website has a lot more information on what they do and the ways that you can get involved. So visit victoriasiegelfoundation.org. It's on your screen, you can jot it down. And you can also watch the Princess of Versailles documentary on Jackie's YouTube channel. She just mentioned it. That's what it is, it's the real queen of Versailles.